Hello everyone, welcome. Um, sorry, was that a bit loud? Either way, um, sorry. Uh, so hello, welcome um, everyone back to our normal thing of editing live uh, your images, uh, not mine. Um, so we do enough of my images on other things. Uh, this is your opportunity to send in files. Uh, we'll then pick them up um, once a month and hopefully we'll get around to doing your one um, in one of these sessions. So we are going to spend the next hour in that program there, as always, Capture One. So Capture One being the raw converter, or raw processing software from the guys in Denmark, um, in Copenhagen. And they make the technology that allows us to take the pixels that your camera records on the sensor and convert them, make them hopefully better and bring them back to what you remember seeing because obviously the raw data sometimes is a bit flat, uh, it tends to be with the, uh, the general um, trend that people notice. And then we produce, um, hopefully, a beautiful photograph at the end. And that's what we're going to go through today with some of your pictures. So first things first, uh, we're going to cover the version that's actually um, being used today on Capture One. In fact, we're going to go even earlier than that. First, first things first. So to David's point, um, tried to upload an EIP today, but we transfer kept timing out. I'm going to cover some of the stuff on how we actually transfer files and images around. We'll do that in a minute. Um, but to do that and to send in files in to be edited, it's through that tool there. Um, so let me just lose that out of the way. So Paul Reefer Live, oh, sorry, my own name, paulreeferlive.wetransfer.com. Um, go to that address. You can upload either the raw file or an EIP, and we'll talk about the EIP thing in a minute. Um, Please include your name, but that's how you get a raw file to us. We'll then try and get through as many as we can in one of these sessions, and hopefully we can help you out um, if there's a problem with, with that you're trying to get over. So Capture One itself, today we are now using, as of about 45 minutes ago, um, this one, 16.3.3. or 16 .3 .3. Capture One is no longer called Capture One Pro, it's no longer called Capture One Pro 22, 23, 21 anything like that, it's now called, miraculously, Capture One, as far as your um, icon is concerned in your application. Now, some of the um, elements online and some of the elements in the program, obviously, you can see up, where is it there? Um, it still says it's still got the remnants of Capture One Pro as a title, but your icon as of 16.3, I think it was, will have changed to just Capture One. There's no version number anymore. To find that out, you have to go to the About Capture One screen within the program. Now, for those of you that are on a subscription, you've got access to any version um, that's current, um, as long as your subscription remains current. For those of you that have bought a perpetual license, you are okay as long as, let me pull up a Grover pointer. We haven't seen him for a while. There he is. Um, you're okay for this version here. Oops, I just deleted the Grover pointer. That wasn't very good, was it? You're okay up until here. So this bit, the major number, the 0.3 bit, not the point, um, point 0.3. Anything that comes in here will become a free upgrade for you, no problem. The second this changes, so the 0.3, the, oh, it's annoying that it's 0.3.3. I can't do it very easily, but the first point after the 16, that's the version that you have bought as a perpetual license, which means when it goes 16.3.4, no problem. 0.3.5, no problem. 0.3.6, no problem. When it goes to 16.4, you're going to need to decide whether you want to upgrade or not, because your perpetual license does not include an upgrade beyond a minor point release, which is that the second dot, the bit after the second dot. Now, with that said, um, for those of you that didn't know, um, there used to be a version of Capture One called Capture One Express. So it's this version here. Um, and the, it, for some of you will remember this, there used to be branded versions. There was a, a Capture One for Canon, Capture One for Sony, Capture One for Nikon, whatever. Um, they all got rolled into Capture One Pro, as it were, quite a few years back now, I think, a couple of years ago at least. Um, but there was still this version out there, which was effectively a free version uh, of Capture One, a very basic stripped down version called Capture One Express. That's been discontinued. Um, there are notes that have gone out from Capture One, I believe, to everyone that currently runs Capture One Express with upgrade paths to the full version of Capture One. But the free version is no longer going to be supported from January. I think it's the end of January from memory. Um, but most or most importantly for you guys, if you are running Capture One Express, 
Capture One have actually indicated that they plan to actually stop it working full stop when that goes end of life. So it's not just a case of you won't get any more upgrades, it will actually stop working. When that does, we have a potential issue in terms of how do you access your images. So two things. One is you can export all those images out of Capture One Express. Two, you can always, and this is always the case, whenever there's a new version of Capture One that's released, you can go and download a free trial. So that works for 30 days. You can access um, all the tools, and that goes for anyone that's even not using Capture One. You know, By all means, go download a free trial, have a play with it for 30 days anyway. Um, but that would be one of the paths that you've got to be able to access, because obviously it's a, or Capture One Express is always a cut down version, so the full version is able to open your catalogs or sessions and edits, no problem. But yeah, so there's a news, that thing, um, Capture One Express, um, if you are running it and it came effectively free with the camera that you bought, if you didn't upgrade to the full version of Capture One at the end of January, you're going to find that's no longer working. Now, for those people that are on it, apparently there's an email that's gone out and there's um, upgrade offers and, and so on, but not my decision, it's Capture One's decision. Um, they've um, decided that they're going to focus all of their energy, strangely, um, on the paid versions. Um, and actually, there's a there's a broader thing here, which is, and I genuinely don't know, but I do know one thing, which is the the, the agreements and, and um, behind-the-scenes stuff between camera companies and software companies is more complex than anyone knows. So it may not be that this is a one-sided decision, I'm not sure, um, but there may be other things going on in the background as well. Uh, but one way or another, if you're on Capture One Express, start making plans for beyond the end of January in terms of how you're going to manage that transition away. But today, 16.3.3, the reason that's a really important version today is it's a massive fix for people that tether. So Apple released, uh, for those of you that are on Apple actually specifically, if you are on Apple uh, Mac OS and you upgraded to 14.2, which is the latest release, you will find that you may have problems with tethering and also some people have reported slider issues and so on. 16.3.3 um, fixes the problem that was introduced in Mac OS 14.2. So to be clear, it wasn't a Capture One bug. It's a problem with Mac OS. It's affecting more than just Capture One as well. But the Capture One guys have found a way of fixing that effectively in a, in a point release. So if you are on 16.3 whatever, Please update to uh, please update to the latest one because that means that hopefully everything's working back to normal, um, so everything's all good again. Um, Tim, your point, yeah, I know it's not your decision, but making it stop working sounds like a very user unfriendly decision that might backfire. Um, I so again, this is my view; it's not Capture One's view. I'm not. I don't disagree, Tim. Actually, I, I think. Um, I think stopping development on a on a branch is one thing. Um, I'm not sure of the complications. Maybe it's down to the way that the licensing server um, operates and needs support and so on. Um, so I, I don't know the background to it. But yes, um, there there is a um, there's, there's a bit of pushback. Let's put it that way from from users that are getting a bit of a shock that unfortunately their version will stop. Um, that free version will stop at the end of January. Uh, and yes, actually, to a wider point. Good point, Tim. Um, tethering didn't affect me because I didn't upgrade my Mac OS. So here's a fun one. I think from memory, and I'm happy to be wrong, but from memory, because I've seen lots of people putting out online um, the, you know, does it work on this? Does it work on that? Um, so does does Capture One 16.3 point one or two work on the latest OS. And you'll see people saying, well, I'm running it and it's fine. I'm running it, it's fine. So, well, so why wouldn't you upgrade? Well, until Capture One come out and say our software, and this applies to any software, but until they come out and say, we have tested our software on that version of Mac OS, assume it doesn't work. Because the person that's saying to you, oh no, it works fine, you don't know. They might not tether. They might not use the color balance tool. They might not use before and after. They might not use a certain thing that's really important to you, but it has not been tested until Capture One say, yes, this version of Capture One is tested and is compatible with this version of an OS, and that applies to Windows as much as it does to Mac. Just hold back. You, generally speaking, you're not missing anything that you didn't know you, you wanted in the first place, which is what happens with a lot of OS updates. So chill out. Relax, wait until the software companies, for all of your software, say that they're um, they're ready and then do the update. And you might find that um, life's a bit simpler, a little bit easier. 
So, um, there we go. News announcements, fire exits, all covered. Um, and yeah, Paula, um, so OS upgrades. And again, applies exactly the same to Windows updates as well. Um, try and wait for a 0.1 or, or 0.2 um, version. So, just to be safe. Um, let, let other people be the guinea pigs. Let them be eager. Um, but keep your stuff working. So, let's go into Capture One. Um, this is a shot from Mark. And as I say, we're going to cover a couple of things very early on. One is a little change to the interface that I've had a couple people... In f <laughs> funny story. Uh, early this week, we were actually out filming um, for something that you'll see very soon. Um, but we were with another photographer who was in the back of the car reviewing images. And he said, Paul, what, what on earth is this? Well, not quite the words, but what on earth is this thing that's coming up on the screen? Um, it's getting in the way all the time. Um, and I didn't actually know until I'd, I'd seen it. And then, ah, I got it. Okay. So in Capture One, let's give you an example. Let's uh, do before and after. Look at this here. Before, after shown. Guides. Guides shown. Grid. Grid shown. Grid hidden. Before and after hidden. Guides hidden. It's basically narrating my life. Bit, bit weird. Mask. So mask visibility settings. Now set to always display mask. Can be kind of handy if, if you're into that. Um, but for those of you that aren't, if you don't want it, it's a new setting. I'm not exactly sure when I came in. But um, yeah, fun and game. So under your Capture One settings, which for some reason didn't pop up then. Um, it's not under warnings, it's under notifications. So you have here in app uh, visual feedback displayed at the bottom of your screen. So if you don't want those constant things popping up, you can turn it off. And then when you go to before and after, just like before, it's not going to warn you. Now, this has obviously come from user feedback. So people have obviously been, and I'll give you the example, the mask one, you know, is my mask on or off? Well, if I've got a mask drawn, I can see, and I've got the little indicator up here to say I'm, I'm viewing the mask or I'm not. But some people want that sort of visual clue um, or cue, clue, whichever way you want to look at it. Uh, so that's what's, well, that's the setting. It's the default is shown. So just bear in mind that is going to narrate your life if you're in Capture One now down the bottom, and it will tell you the last thing that you did. So that's our um, that's our notification thing. Let's cover how we get an image out of Capture One. And for that, I'm actually going to go to maybe... Uh, have we got a raw? We're going to come on to these files in a bit. Um, these are all EIPs, which is a little bit annoying. But anyway, let's imagine this is a TIFF file. Sorry, a TIFF file. Let's imagine this is a raw file. An EIP actually is a raw file. It's just wrapped with the changes. And that's actually how we can transport all of my adjustments to someone else. So if you're wanting to export your files out of Capture One, there are kind of two main ways that we do it. So this file obviously has adjustments built into it. If I were to right click and go to export, or I go to the export dialog box up here, I'm exporting the final, let's call it baked in version. So the, the, the finished product. When I export that as a TIFF or as a JPEG or, or any of these formats here, except potentially DNG, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, what I'm doing is I'm baking into the file. It becomes a flat file with the adjustments applied. I cannot go back. I can't reverse engineer it. So this TIFF file, if I give this output, the export, as a TIFF to someone, they get exactly what I'm seeing on the screen. They cannot see any of the work that was done from the original to here. And this one has been very worked. Um, we'll, we'll go through that in a second. But if you imagine sending someone what you think is that, and you actually send them that, that's no good. So you send them this, and the way you do that is through exporting it as a as a finished file. Now, that's all well and good, but what happens if I do want to send someone the changes? So like me, if you want to send it on WeTransfer. Well, we can export it differently. So we go to export original files rather than the standard export dialog. When I go to the original files thing, um, so let's call it that. Um, Let's say it's, I don't know, go into my desktop, whatever, no subfolder, but it's this tick box here that's important, pack as EIP. And actually, if you hold it or hold your mouse over it, it'll give you the little tooltip. So pack the raw image as an EIP. EIP 
is a format that's very, very specific to Capture One. So what an EIP file is, if you actually went into your operating system and unpacked it or uncompressed it or unpackaged it, depending on how you want to use the word, you'll find in there the raw file and then a load of Capture One files. And those Capture One files are your masks, your adjustments, all the XMP stuff, the stuff that tells Capture One what to do with that file. And when you bring it into Capture One, you'll see it actually load in as the raw file first, and then it'll go pop. And the pop is when it's applied all the other bits from that EIP package for the other person to see. So if you ever want to send your raw file with adjustments to someone, a retoucher or someone else with Capture One, or even actually if you want to export out of a, let's say you've got a catalog with all your files built into Capture One and you want to get them all out, with the adjustments, most importantly, well, rather than sending the whole catalog, you just could select the files that you want, export the originals, and that's the key. It's the bit that confuses people, so export original files. But the original files you'll see here, including adjustments. So you pack it as an EIP, includes adjustments, because that's what an EIP is, and the person at the other end, when they get that EIP, they've got not only your raw file, but everything you did to it as well. I said I'd touch on DNG. There is a problem, and it's a limitation, and it really annoys me, I'm going to be honest. Um, if you use Capture One's function of creating an HDR image or creating a panoramic image, so a stitched panorama, a DNG file cannot be exported in the IP. So you can't export a DNG with the adjustments into an EIP. What you actually have to, well, what I've found a way of doing it is actually sending catalogs to people or sessions to people with the session files, which is madness. Um, but that's the one limitation. So if you, let's imagine you have a catalog or a session full of images. Some of them are normal images. Some of them are blends with HDR or stitches with panoramic. What you'll find is in your activity log or your event viewer, so in Capture One, go to window and then event log, you'll find that certain files, Capture One says I can't do anything with it, um, tough, and you'll find that they're DNGs. So it cannot pack up at the moment um, the adjustment against a DNG. Whether it's because other programs can't read them, I, I don't know. Um, but just bear that in mind. You can only at the moment pack up raw files with adjustments. You can't do it as a as a blended or a stitched version of a raw. Whew. Okay. Um, Rick, EIP export requires a recipient to have Capture One. Does it also require a specific version of Capture One? So, yes, it requires them to have Capture One. It doesn't necessarily need the same version. So, for example, as long, most importantly, actually, let me give you the, the clue. In here, where it says Engine, as long as you're using the same engine as someone else, I can send them an EIP. Generally speaking, there are, there are sometimes I've seen this quirk sort of pop up, but for example, I would be comfortable sending this file here to someone on any version that's 16.x and potentially a version of 15.x. The only problem you'll find is if you've got a certain functional feature, let's say um, dehaze. Well, obviously, if I try and import a file, an EIP file into an older version of Capture One that doesn't have dehaze, it's not going to know what to do with that tool. So yes-ish, but just bear in mind, not all tools go across versions. And if the EIP includes those adjustments, it's just going to throw them away. You wouldn't know. Um, is this, so JD, is there something similar to export a EIP that can be used by Photoshop? Um, on to make adjustments, catch the review. However, the retoucher only uses um, Photoshop for post production. No, short answer. Um, if they're only using Photoshop for post production, then you're going to need to make any raw edits. Um, now, obviously, they can use Adobe Camera Raw to bring the file in, but then they're starting from from scratch in that sense. And um, JD, you're on a Phase One system, so Adobe Camera Raw. I don't think we'll do a very good job of reading it. So you have to make your adjustments in there um, from raw um, and send them effectively the finished file, which I'd suggest is a 16-bit TIFF because it's going to give you the most information. Um, right, let's go and have a little look at this shot because you've all been looking at it long enough. Um, so this is a shot from Mark. This is Oxbow Bend, funnily enough, where um, David Grover and I were broadcasting from a, a few months back. Um, and let's go to the original. So this is what the camera saw. This is what Mark has edited it through to. And, you know, it's a nice edit. Um, I, my, my, my initial 
impression with it is it's too saturated in here i think it's gone a bit too golden um the the, the temptation to try and pull out any pink from the sky i know I, i've done it I've, i get it I, I understand the the temptation but you know this amount of pink is not what was there um so it's there's a there's a challenge here in terms of artistically do we push something in one direction or do we keep it true to to raw as it were um but yes there is pink up there um and and the decision to to boost it is something that quite a lot of us do um the challenge that i've got is yes we've boosted the pink up there but also look at these trees they've gone from from what i can see you know a, a quite muted color through the fog and through the mist there's a lot of dehaze that seems to have been used on here but what that's done is it's saturated all of those trees to be really really quite bright um so we'll have a look at, at what's gone on um, in there. But let's have a look first at one of the layers in here that I saw, which, oh, Mark, I feel for you. Um, <clears throat> where are we? Is it this layer? One of the layers. I'm trying to find, there we are. Oh, dust spots. So I don't know what version of Capture One you're using, Mark, but if it's one that's recent, you've got a tool that does this. Um, so let's just clone that variant. I'm going to remove this healing layer off of this version. Um, so the reason I've cloned the variant is so that we're not obliterating the work that Mark's already done. So I've got this as a reference, which was the original, and this version here. So in this version, I'm removing the layer that was the dust spot um, removal. And if we wanted to see the dust spots, you know, they are up there there's a few so there's one here one here one here for those of you that want to um, play we've covered this many times before search on my channel and you'll find a, a reference to a dust spot finder or a, we call it a yuck delete layer i think at the time we created it so i'm going to create a new filled adjustment layer so in other words the layer applies to everything full mask and I'm going to load in a curve that I've created called this one, dust spot rainbow. You can call it rainbow splat, rainbow finder. I don't care. Um, there's different ways of doing it, but basically it's a massive sine wave curve. And what that's doing is it's stretching contrast. So in the distance, if you look along here, so these values along the bottom, from 45 to 62, look at that input value from 45 to 62, which would normally be 17 steps along the, the normal curve of 0 to 255, we've stretched it from 0 to 255. So in other words, the leap from 45 to 46 isn't just one. We've, we've magnified it, so it's whatever that, that math works out as. It's like 14. So in other words, what we're seeing is a huge change in contrast between tiny little variations, and that's how you see all the dust spots. Now, let me just, in fact, I need to just clone Mark's one and leave the dust spot thing on there. But I'm going to add the same layer. And we'll see. So this is with, this is with Mark's spots healed. So this is the one without the healing layer. This is the one with the healing layer. And you will see there's a lot more dust spots that weren't even necessarily easily visible. The problem with dust spots is you typically see them a lot cleaner when it's printed. When it's printed, they're a real pain because you can't get rid of them on paper. You've got to go back to the original file and then you've got some cost involved. So while this version here on the right is better than this version, all we've got effectively is a reduction in the more visible dust spots. And if I really looked into this version here. So let's, uh, let's just zoom in on both sides. This little dust spot here, you can see it there. So this is Mark's version on the right with the manual healing. And this is the version with nothing healed on the left. But you can see that even though there was a huge amount of dust spots out uh, on the on the image that Mark's already got. So let's let's go back to that. You know, that's a lot of work uh where are we let's get back to my healing brush tools a lot of work to try and fix all of those it's still not enough because it hasn't fixed all the other ones so yes jd solution number one clean your gear before you shoot now it's not always possible if you're out for the whole day 
you know, out in dusty areas or, or windy areas or whatever, it's not always possible to. But I'd, I'd say this is probably a build-up over a bit of time. It's always possible to fix a dust spot in the, the raw file, but it's so much better to not have to. Um, so, yes, clean your gear. Uh, there's another one in there uh, in the lake that we didn't necessarily see. So the second, though, is as of the last update, um, or the, no, was it 16 point? Is it point 0.1 or point 0.2? Something like that. Um, we've got a dust spot tool. So if I just remove this one, let's go to the one that doesn't have Mark's dust spot healing on it. I'm going to put the layer on so we can see them. And I'm going to go to my lens tab. If I don't have dust removal down here, it's probably because I'm running a workspace that, that I designed my workspace before the version that came out with the tool. Right click, go to add tool, and you'll find dust removal. Dust removal down here. Let's just click on remove dust. This happens across the image. And so it's better. So it's not, again, it's not perfect, but it's certainly better than where it was left when it was manual. And it's only leaving a few extra little ones in there to deal with. But that's going to be a lot, lot quicker than doing it by hand with all of those individual little you know, button presses and, and worries and whatever else. So a couple of things. If you want to find the dust spots, then load in one of these massive sine waves in your curve. Save it if you want to. Um, number two, um, yes, you can do it manually, but, but maybe try the dust spot removal thing first. Using the dust spot removal thing doesn't stop you then going into the healing layer. It also doesn't stop you using the standard remove dust button. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just a bit easier. Um, yeah, a lot easier. Just use it. Use the tool first. See if you can get it clean. If you can't, then do the extra bits. Um, so let's, because obviously you've got the tool still in here, the remove dust tool. So if I click on this, um, then you can actually see what it's done. And oh, hold on, I just saw a, a question. Jeffrey, is there a way to know that if you've already applied the dust tool? <clears throat> sometimes I run it the whole shoot. Sometimes I forget. So. There isn't, in, and what I mean by that is if I'd actually gone through and clicked all of these manually and then run the dust spot removal tool, I wouldn't be able to tell which ones were manual and which were from the tool because it, it basically places the same things and I can move these around. But if I haven't gone in to run my own manual spot removal tool, then the second I go to the spot removal tool, so the, the dust spot removal function in Capture One, this one, these will show if it's applied it. So so yes and no. Um, so there's not like a flag saying dust spot removal has been run on this image. But if you were to go into the spot removal tool, you would see that there are a load of spot removals done. And if you didn't do them, then it must have been the tool. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, please clean your kit. I, I say that to myself as well. So I don't do it. I'm, I'm one of the worst at it. But oh man it will save you a nightmare um, but if you want to find dust spots then use a sine wave uh, if you want to give it a first pass use the dust spot removal tool that's now built into capture one and then use the healing brush to get rid of things that it couldn't do itself you might find that's going to save you an awful lot um jeff can you not do spot removal on import i don't think you can actually from memory i don't because it has to analyze the image i don't think it's like it's a a recipe or or a style or anything it has to actually run on the image but I'll, I'll have a little experiment later i may be wrong um but i'm pretty sure that you can't so back to the image itself so we've got our dust spots done we've talked about that um we've, we've killed the dust spot issue um then we're talking about the rest of the image so let's just go through mark's layers on here i'm just going to turn them all off one by one so that we can sort of do a bit of a review um, so we start with the base image layer and actually even the image layer itself has already got some adjustments on here. And this is where I get a little bit nervous with some of the, the tweaks that have happened on here. So saturation, as we know, is quite a powerful slider in the base version of this shot before any layers are added, Mark's dialed in 20 on saturation. Now you can see it's making a very small change. That's the original. That's the saturation original saturation it's really subtle but it's because there's not much saturation in the scene 
So this is almost like trying to, to squeeze the last remaining juice out of a lemon, because what we've got up here then is a separate layer called sat, I'm guessing saturation, yep, and that's adding another 30 onto it. So there's, you, you've got, it, not many of us would have dialed in 50 in saturation. Dialing in 50 in saturation is really pushing saturation beyond what was there. But that's effectively the effect that's happened. So we've got the image layer at 20. On top of that, a separate saturation layer um, on 30. And in that image layer, there's a curve adjustment here on the RGB curve. Now, what that means is not only is it lifting the luminosity levels, it's also perceptually lifting and changing the saturation level. So we've got a push in saturation in the curve, a pull down here in highlights, and that's fine. Um, we've got a little bit of a color change, so we've added uh, a color in there for, for pink. It's not been used, but I'm not sure exactly why um, that's even there actually in that case. Um, but then on top of all that, we then got a saturation layer that's also doing a saturation um, change. I don't think from memory there's anything in here no but it is pushing saturation another node up then we've got an hdr layer and that hdr layer is doing some highlight recovery some white recovery so it's effectively pulling down the brightness of the highlights and the whites that has an it that has an effect not exactly but it has an effect of lifting saturation a little bit um We've got a lift of blacks, which actually reduces contrast, which is interesting because there's then a clarity layer on top here, which is adding contrast in. Um, if we go into here, so it's quite a boost of clarity at 34. So all these things sort of adding up together, we've got a curve change, a base saturation change, another layer with full saturation. Then we've got the highlight recovery. Then we've got a clarity um, layer. All of those things are boosting and boosting and boosting saturation. And one thing, and in fact, let's go beyond that. So dehaze then happens on top. There's then an exposure layer on the on the sky. Now remember as well, and again, this is perceptual. Again, when I reduce exposure, it has the effect visually of increasing the the, the perceived saturation of color. So again, I'm doing that on on the top part. So we're we're darkening that down there. The watercolor um, that's been enhanced. So on there. I'm not sure exactly where that was done. Let's have a little look. Was it in an advanced color edit? Yep. Yeah. So we've got a saturation boost of purple and blue again. So another 20 or 17.8 plus a darkening down, which also has the effect of, of saturating. So in other words, we've got saturation, 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 contrast, saturation. And one of the things that you'll hear me say on, on many um, of these sessions is keep an eye on before and after. Because... Yes, this looks nice, but it's way away from where we started. And that line, we've got to work out how much we're comfortable with in, in terms of pushing. For me, if we want to keep that pink in the sky, there's no issue with that. But I think this is possibly a bit too golden down the bottom. And it's one thing just to, to bear in mind. So if I look at the, the masks, we've got a, a rough mask around the water, no problem. A rough, well, a graduated mask around the sky. The dehaze mask covers everything apart from the water. Clarity mask applies to everything. The HDR mask applies to everything. The saturation mask applies to everything. And then we've got that heel layer in there as well, which was just to fix something in there. So what I would be doing personally is probably, and, and because obviously the decision was made to do this to the whole image, we're going to undo some of it on this area here. So I'm going to create a new layer and I'm going to put a very, very soft radial mask into here and i'm just going to pull back a bit of that saturation out here into the forest it's not a lot i'm just going to back away maybe 20 out of it um, and then the same in this foreground here so i'm going to say desaturate trees and then uh, another empty one desaturate foreground and there's there's two reasons why i'm going to desaturate the foreground the first is I think it's too saturated. It actually takes away the attention from the mountain. There's a blue and great big mountain out there. That's what we want to look at. We want to look at the reflection in the lake and the mountain. The foreground is incidental. In fact, I know this spot exceptionally well, and, and the foreground can be really annoying if you don't get in the right spot. There's a person there as well we need to, uh, we need to deal with one way or another. Um, but let's look at that foreground. So let's create a new gradient on there. 
So soft gradient mask. And I could, if I wanted to, I could actually erase using the AI eraser some of the bits I don't want, like this around the, the shoreline. If I click here, it's going to say, do I want to rasterize the mask? The reason is because a gradient mask can't be painted and the AI brush is basically a painting mask. So yes, I do. Turn that gradient into a standard mask. Thank you. And I'm going to turn my mask on so I can see it. I'm going to go to the refine button and I want to really soften those edges so I don't notice there's a mask that's been drawn. Let's just see where it gets to. There we go. That's pretty neat, actually. It's done a, a pretty good job um, of, of isolating the, the leaves and the twigs. And with that foreground, I can then pull back that saturation a touch again. And, and this is the key bit. Let's just pull down that exposure a touch and actually pull down contrast. So I'm flattening the foreground. I'm, I'm changing how much of an impact this foreground, let me just get rid of the AI mask tool off of that, how much of the foreground is dominating the rest of the shot. So you can see in there, I've desaturated, I've reduced contrast, I've reduced exposure. And remember I said exposure and saturation are kind of linked perceptually. So if I know I'm going to darken something, I might want to bring the, the saturation down so I don't end up increasing saturation as a result of bringing down the um, the brightness. So that just helps me push out to that mountain that's out in the distance. Now the mountain, let's create a, um, it's Mount Moran that one I think, this one from memory. I often get them confused, either way. Um, so I'm going to use the AI brush and just click on that bit, thank you, click on that bit and that bit. We could give a selection a go, but it's actually not too much bother clicking on these. That's done a pretty good job of outlining. And then exactly the same as before. So I'm going to switch to my grayscale mask. The way I did that was Option and M or Alt and M or up here, go to display grayscale mask um, and you'll get the same thing. Now with that, I'm going to say refine mask, which is also this button here. It's going to soften that mask down. I don't want to go too soft. So when it's thought about it, yeah, it's a bit too soft. So we'll go down to maybe there, apply, and then just on the mountain. So not the rest of this scene, but just on the mountain, we can then push that clarity a little more. We can actually increase our contrast a little more, and we could even pull down exposure just to give it a bit more presence. So let's just darken it a touch. But that goes from there out in the mist to there a bit more present and that's just with those three changes so we've got let's just turn them off and back on so we've got a desaturation out here relatively subtle but it just takes that edge off it stops things being quite that you know overly sort of putrid yellow that, that if it's pushed too far yellow has a, a tendency to do that desaturate the foreground in other words let's get the viewer looking away from that use it as a lead in sure but that's not the interesting part that is and then of the interesting part, let's give it a bit of a pop with clarity and contrast. Done. Um, that person, let's have a little look. Um, quick healing brush and let's make our size a bit bigger. Nice soft edge. And ooh, where are we going to pick? Let's pick from there. I'm just going to try and hide this pretty quickly. So I'm just moving our source point. So we've got where we're painting and our source point here, this little yellow blob. That's done a reasonable job. I think that's good enough for what we need here. And person gone, which is nice. Um, now that's gone onto the standard heel layer that Mark already put in. So unless you choose a new heel layer, remember Capture One will go to the utmost heel layer to add any more healing brush um, technique on it. But that's sort of where I'd, I'd get to um but just if i just reset this back to basics so yes this is a nice shot it's a it's a very nice postcardy shot it, it works well it, it shows that location really nicely i think it's pushed a little far um this backs it away a little bit but i would honestly always 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 keep that before and after thing as a as a benchmark because these could have been taken on two different days they're, they're, it's very very different um, to the source um, image that was there and that may be the intention um, it may be the intention to push it there but 
please, 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 when you're editing, constantly, before, after, and, and keep an eye on it. Just And what I tend to do, just as a, a benchmark, I'll edit, fine, with before and after, and then I'll often go through all of my layers and use this opacity slider and just back them away, one at a time. Um, just just pull them away, you know, so 70%, 60%, 70%, just so that you've got a bit of a, a bit of margin in there, um, sort of back towards the raw um, rather than pushing it beyond. But yeah, nice edit. Um, it works. It, it ticks the boxes. Um, just just bear in mind, the more and more you push saturation and contrast, um, the more bold those areas look and especially here in this foreground if that's got its saturation and contrast boosted this becomes dominant in the picture not necessarily the background out there um Carsten, does reducing the clarity in the sky help reduce sensor spot yes it does um so if you think about what clarity does it is typically referred to as a mid-tone um, contrast adjustment so it's looking for tiny variations a bit like that that rainbow thing it's looking for tiny variations and it's trying to stretch them. So it's making more contrast out of very small amounts of change. If you use negative clarity, so in other words, if we were to go on to our clarity tool here and move this slider to the left rather than to the right, it's doing the opposite. It's finding midtones and it's bringing them together. So that can give you the effect of almost mist. It can give you the effect of smoothing water to a certain amount, not a, not a massive amount. Um, but it also then can help you get rid of tiny little contrast things that are annoying. One of those would be dust spots. So yes, if you want a, a blanket saving um, tool, then yep, um, whack on some negative clarity, see where you get to. But again, I would still start off with that dust removal tool first. See what Capture One can do first. Do any major things it's missed using the healing brush, just like you would do normally, and then maybe if you needed to um, put some some more clarity in there or some negative clarity in. The other thing that, that negative clarity can help with is banding in the sky. Um, if you've got a if you see ever any um, streaks in the sky, that and adding maybe some fine grain um, will fix that. Okay, um, back to so last week we or last week last month we we tackled Charlie's um, shot, which. He got a bit of a telling off for on his masks, but there's a reason um, that the, the masks need to be um, they need to be tight, especially when we're dealing with with images like this, where it's around this rock edge and, and jagged stuff. So here's another shot. Um, now this shot doesn't actually have and doesn't need really any mask that's particularly tight on um, the islands and stuff. This actually lends itself to these sort of rough shaped masks, you know, low flow masks that help. One thing I would always tell people, and I don't do myself quite often, it frustrates me because I forget, is name your layers so you know what you're editing when you go back to them. But let's just run through them quickly. So there's an adjustment out here to get rid of that sky being um, overblown. So that's a, a pulling down the contrast completely. If I were to turn that off, you'll see it's too bright. Turn it on, there's the detail in there. Um, it could have been done as well with maybe a highlight recovery, but this has worked perfectly well, so Charlie's picked the right tool in that sense. Um, this mask here is to accentuate these, these waveforms down here. This one here, um, out here, just again, pulling up contrast um, out into those waves. Now, one thing you need to bear in mind with contrast adjustment and I'm just going to uh, use, where can I pull here? Uh, that's a bad example, actually. Contrast is going to look at effectively the midpoint of the image, um, so that one to eight level, and make anything that's brighter than that even brighter, and anything that's darker even darker. If I have an image with huge amounts of content that is left of the middle of the histogram, so in other words, all the content sits in the shadows, increasing contrast so let's imagine all that content you've got some slightly brighter bits and slightly darker bits so the temptation then is to think Ooh, contrast if i put the contrast slider up it's going to make the brighter parts brighter and the darker parts darker no if they sit in the shadows if the bright parts bright in quotes sit in the shadows and the darker parts sit in the shadows when you push contrast it's going to push all of that even darker so just be careful with the contrast tool. If you need to add contrast into a specific region of the histogram, so in the shadows or in the highlights, you're going to need to do it in curves. And you're going to need to do something like 
let's just click in here so I put an anchor there so we're not affecting anything up here and in here I want these bits of the shadows to get lighter these bits of the shadows to get darker that's a shadow area contrast adjustment so it's changing the contrast within the shadows not across the whole histogram so just be careful with the contrast tool depending on the subject that you're trying to make the contrast change to um, out here we've got a sky um, alteration you see a lot of contrast added in this image um, up here big brightness change in that mountain now some people would have used the um, hdr slider so this has been done with a very rough mask let's just show you there just to bring up um the brightness out there now funnily enough the reason these these brightness and saturation sliders look like they've been pushed massively to the right they have but the reason is because the mask is so low so that this isn't even anywhere near 100 percent mask this is probably only 25 percent mask so remember all of these sliders are linked to how much mask you've painted on if i painted on 100 percent, then the area that i've painted is getting 32 adjustment in brightness and 52 in saturation if i've only painted on 25 percent of opacity then that 52 i'm only actually getting 12 and a half or 13 percent of it because it's only the the opacity of the mask times by the adjustment so there are two ways of doing it one is paint the mask more strongly and use less on the sliders the other is to do this which is use a big adjustment on the sliders and then paint in as much as you need now as i say some people would have done it differently they might have gone to an adjustment layer and let's use the ai ai brush just because it's there so click on there that's done a pretty good job i'm going to refine it just to soften the edges and with our ai brush i think it was was it this one which one was it layer three yeah so i'm just going to say um hill so with our ai brush we're going to call that ai hill i could lift up sorry i like lift up the shadows there and i probably have a bit more control and it's a bit more specific control than just this sort of brushing in across it the two used together also works so an overall brightness adjustment on that hill i could back away this opacity a little bit and then this one here i could back away how much that's lifted so using them together great um you can absolutely double down on the tools you can use one that's a very rough and ready brush over the top and then another which is slightly less um, or slightly more specific but with a very specific tool like the shadow um, adjustment in here but again no wrong answer in how to do that um, it's just a, a way possibly that's a bit cleaner um, be careful with the ai brush by the way this gets really annoying right after a while so when you're on the ai brush you're going to see that even if you've got a mask showing as I start to move around, that mask changes because the AI brush is trying to guess what you want to click on next. So press the V button on your keyboard um, and you'll always go back to just the normal pointer or the H button and you'll get back to the hand and it will stop doing that if that's getting in the way. So um, this, again, more contrast in there, more gradient um, on there, um, a little bit of brightness pull down on the sky. Again, brightness versus expo exposure, slightly different tools. Exposure would darken everything. Brightness would darken purely, well, sorry, it will squash. So it will darken the mid-tones more than it will the shadows as you pull them down. Protects the shadows, basically. Um, and then this adjustment here is just a little brightness adjustment overall. So all of those little adjustments, you saw quite a lot of contrast being used. Let's go back to the same point, before and after. So could I have predicted that the before was really, really low contrast? Yes, simply because look at all those layers that are adding contrast in there, apart from that one, ironically. So 20 on contrast on that layer, 19 on contrast on that layer, 19 on that layer. The hill has got a contrast adjustment of 18. Uh, the, the water one's there, 17. There's another one up here. All of those contrast adjustments are compounded to make a very high contrast image out of a standard one. Um, Paula, did I notice these strange banding artifacts on the screen while scrolling through the AI mask? Yeah, I've, I've seen it as well. Um, so if I were to go to my AI brush, you'll see, there we go. Um, 
it it does a weird thing. I don't know whether it is actually picking up banding. What it's what it's effectively doing is saying, look, this bit here is very similar to the content it can see up here in the sky, but not all of it. And it may be that what it's doing is picking up on, you can see here slightly, let's just go in a bit more. We've got these sort of um, these lines across here, whether it's banding or whether it's actually in the cloud. I think it may even be in the cloud. Um, but I'm zoomed in you know, too much here. We're at 200%. But the AI mask is picking up on some of that, that alteration. When you choose the sky, it seems to do it correctly. But when you're out here at the water, you can see it's sort of it's getting a bit confused. Um, but that's another reason why you press V on your keyboard. You know, get rid of that that brush. Um, go back to the select tool or the hand tool, um, either way. Right. So, yeah, on that one, Charlie, um, compared to the other one, because you've used a lot more soft masks and soft gradients and more subtle ways of, of making the changes, you don't have the problem that we had in the other image last month, which was those halos around the outsides and the rocks and stuff like that. So it's this is a much easier edit to manage because you didn't have the need to to mask around the shape if you are going to mask around the shape oh man use the ai tools if you can um they do a good job if they don't use the magic brush if that doesn't then go back to the normal way of, of brushing stuff you can still use auto mask you can still use luma ranges um all of that stuff works but the ai brush in this case does a good job um I come back to that one speaking of good jobs on ai masks um so georg's question was how to separate the car from the rest of the garage um, one way is to do this exactly that which is what um he's done which i'm not sure which layer has got it but i think it may be the background layer let's have a look yeah so that background layer i mean you can see on here exposure minus three and a half stops brightness minus maximum um, just to get rid of basically the background now the problem with getting rid of the background was georg's second question which is how do i get rid of and he said the false color on the car and it's not false color so the car is green but the car's also very shiny and the shininess is picking up on the reflection of the rooftop and of course in this garage, the rooftop was wooden brown. Um, it could even be actually the door, looking at the angle of it. Either way, it's picking up on the brown. So unfortunately, when you take away the context of that background, this then doesn't make sense because, yeah, you get these weird reflection colors of, of stuff that doesn't actually match the car. The car is racing green. It's not, it's not this brown color. So the bad news, Georg, is this car here is probably going to need something like a generative ai um fill to get rid of um we can't really take from here because the perspective changes if i try and heal from this side leaning that way and then move it to the other side the lean is going to be the wrong way in a pixel editor i could pick up this i could flip it and then i could move it across but then this bar isn't necessarily going to be right there are lots of lots of ways that we'll almost get there um one other option just a bit like cleaning the sensor is get the car moved um but obviously it's not always possible if you didn't have control of these guys then then you're not going to be able to but yeah i see the problem now in terms of masking you know we could spend an awful lot of time doing this clicking bit by bit with our ai mask and saying i want that bit i want that bit and so on and getting frustrated or I can remove that and the one that people still aren't using necessarily um, is this button up here which actually is really really good subject click on that it's going to create a mask for me turn my mask on and it's going to get it in my experience it gets it about 99 percent right it adds more things than the individual clicks will do it sometimes adds a bit extra um, and sometimes misses a couple of tiny bits but in general it does a great job to start with and all I've then got to do is just click these extra little bits and then go to my AI eraser. Let's get rid of that bit out of my subject. That's done a pretty good job. I could get rid of this background out here. The closer I get in, the more detailed the eraser and the brush behave. Um, so it's going to help me to get rid of bits that I really don't want, like this bit in here. Let's just see if the eraser will get it. 
So with the AI masking, don't just be zoomed out the whole time and expect it to get it right. For some bits, especially intricate bits around an engine, you are going to need to zoom in and give Capture One a helping hand um, to say, no, this is the bit that I don't want, this is the bit that I do. You can see in here, it's struggling around there. So again, don't just use the AI mask. Use your magic eraser or magic brush. Low tolerance, you know, 100% opacity, really small. Draw in there. There you go. It's done it. Um, the AI brush. Let's just get this chrome bit here. Hopefully it picks that up. Yep. I think that's a bit there. Over here, another bit of chrome. Wait for it to create the mask for us and then potentially in here so again i don't have to use um, the ai brush to remove bits i can use magic brush now the ai so you saw there it got a bit of the car let's just see whether the ai brush will do a better job mm, not really i'd say it's going to struggle oh no there we go so again if it doesn't get it first time zoom in get it get it close help the ai brush to see what it needs to remove um, let's just come out a little bit. So remove that bit. Is it struggling there? So again, if it's struggling, first off, zoom in and try the AI brush. Secondly, if that doesn't help you, then potentially use the magic brush or magic eraser. So in this case, I will magic eraser. It's almost like these old tools still work really well. And they do. Um, so I've now got a subject. Great. Now, I might want to refine it a little bit. Let's just add a little bit more onto that um, little bracket thing there. So back to my AI brush. Add that in there. And then I'm going to switch to a grayscale mask and use the big refine mask button. That's, so refine mask has been promoted so we can see it better now. Um, and then let's go there. Nice. I've now got my mask of my truck, or truck, car. Now, a lot of people are experimenting with this background versus subject or subject um, function. I can click the background function in Capture One, and in theory, it will find the background of my image. In practice, you'll see it's missing, quite often, some of the same parts that the subject selection missed. I wouldn't recommend using a subject mask and a background mask, both done with AI. I would use one or the other, tweak it, create a new layer, right click, copy mask from my subject mask, and then I can invert it. That's a true opposite mask. Now it's not necessarily the same as the background because I could have an object and a background and still other things that aren't um, necessarily in either mask. But in the case where I'm trying to separate two things, subject versus background, I wouldn't actually use the background and subject AI. I would do a not subject um, so again, copy the mask, invert it, and you get the exact opposite of the mask that you've got. So our subject mask is fine. Our not subject mask, I'm going to pull down that exposure a little bit. I wouldn't go to this point, Georg. I don't think it helps you. Um, but you can get to there. Um, and then our subject mask, obviously, we could actually pull up the exposure a touch, especially in shadows. Now, this false color up here, well, a couple things. So... One thing from Anthony, so why not just use the paintbrush in Photoshop in the color mode? Yes, so you could pick on that green, you could paint over here and make those changes. The other option you've got within Capture One, um, in fact, let me just, how am I going to best do this? I'm going to create a new layer, top color. I'm going to copy the mask from my subject so we can see the mask. And I'm going to erase everything out of here that I don't want to affect. Now, in reality, we're going to use a color editor, so it shouldn't be affecting too much else. But just for safety, I'm going to say, yes, we're using the color editor, but only on this bit at the top. So let's just turn our mask off. Color editor. So let's go on to our color tab. It could actually, in the default, it's just down here. Where are we? Down here, basic one. But a lot of us have still got the color tab. So in my color tab up here, I've got basic, advanced, skin tone. Let's go to advanced. I can choose this color here, which has picked up this red. I can also say, show me the selected color range. So it turns everything else to gray so I can see what's going on. And I can shift that hue to be more green or more red. So let's go more green. I can pull down the saturation. 
I can pull down the lightness. Now I've got bits in here that were also captured in that, and that's why we've done it on a masked layer, because you can see the red mask over here is not just affecting the color of the car, it's affecting this stuff. So let's just go to our standard eraser. It doesn't need to be clever. We can pull this nice and small, and we can erase out that wooden handle, we can erase out the brass, we can erase out the leather, so we're not affecting the stuff that we don't want. You get the idea. Um, but that's you know one layer of it. I can do it again and again and again. So I could actually create even a new layer. I could do it again with the color editor, but let's create a new layer and second color. I'm going to copy the mask from top color. Choose this color now. Change the hue to be more green. Change the brightness to be darker. And you see, so we can very quickly build up in the color editor this change from being that brown on the top here to being more green, even more green, with layer and layer and layer, using masks and the color editor, the advanced color editor, to shift the hue. Now, none of this is going to get rid of that car. None of this is going to get rid of that door, but it will get rid of, as Georg said, the false color on the top, and it will help you get this file to a stage where when I then pull it into a pixel editor, when I move it into something that I might use some AI to remove this car, or traditional, old school way, pick on the, the little area of shape over there, copy it across, mirror it, and then paste it onto here. One way or another, you'll get rid of that car on the right, but focus on getting this bit, the subject, right first, and then worry about removing the background when you don't need it. So... I think that's our lot today. There's quite a lot of, of sort of admin-y stuff early on, but A, if you're on Mac OS and you've updated the latest version, please make sure you're on the very latest version of Capture One because it fixes some issues. B, if you're on Capture One Express, be careful. Your software is due to expire literally at the end of January, so you're going to need a plan. One plan is to use the trial version of Capture One Pro, or Capture One, sorry, as it is now. One plan is to um, switch across and you'll have an upgrade deal. The other plan is to export all of your content and, and use that um, in another program of your choice. Um, so we've got car, we've got um, Charlie's next um, seascape, which is, is a lot cleaner in terms of the masking on there. And then Mark's um, beautiful view across Oxbow Bend. It's just be careful with layering saturation on top of saturation and, and keep using that before and after just to keep a, an anchor back um, to where we started. I do it um, because it, it's a bit of a, a reining in every now and then of oops, I may have, I may have tweaked it too much. Uh, next time will be on the 9th of January, um, which is, I think is a Tuesday. Yeah. So we'll edit, we'll start from, um, George's, um, shot here and guessing Thailand. Um, but we'll start from there. Um, we'll, we'll have a little play with what's gone on, um, in here. And we'll um, look at your other ones. So for anyone else that wants to put a file in, please use that address there, um, poorieforlive.retransfer.com. Um, don't forget you've also got all of those masterclasses which are live online um, that you can access um, whenever, in fact, once you've once you've got hold of them. Um, but also keep going on in. You'll see actually notifications and stuff in that Facebook group that cover things like do not upgrade um, to 14.2 until Capture One's been updated. So all of that stuff, normal stuff, um, look after yourselves and we'll catch all of you next month. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.